Hello and welcome to Aspen Wake Media and specifically this is the Aspen Wake History Series and today we're on part five of our exciting series on the birth of the English nation and as always I'm joined by the the strongest Viking in the world now uh, who, who goes under the name of Callum Waite and how are we today Callum? I'm good thanks chap how are you? And how is how is the baby Evelyn? Yeah, she's fine. She's giggling upstairs. Is she engaged in runic activity? Oh, all sorts of activity, yeah. <laughs> very, Me. very good. Dark art. Yeah. Dark art. Anyway, so um, <laughs> today we're talking about um, King Athelstan, um, who I think it's actually quite surprising, which we might talk about later, Callum, uh, why Athelstan didn't manage to get the great uh, labelled with him. So um, I think he... You you could in the same way that we tried to look at um, Ethelfled and uh, put her her place in history into context. Um, I I think you know you could you could make a case for saying Athelstan was arguably the most successful king of any English king in history. I don't think that is a uh, preposterous thing to say. So um, this is a very great man. Um, he was born in 894, and he was uh, the eldest son of uh, his father, Edward the Elder, who we also talked about uh, extensively on uh, the show about uh, Ethelfled, who was Edward the Elder's uh, sister. And um, Cullum talked, told us last week about how Athelstan himself was almost certainly brought up in Mercia by Auntie Ethelfled. Um, now that's probably because um, Athelstan's Athel mother was a, a lady called. Um, I hope I get spot this right. Is probably Etchgwyn actually, or it could be Ekgwyn. Uh, so um, the, one of the problems, as we discussed in, in previous episodes of this particular time in history, is is there are not obviously extensive records, and so some of the things which are noted. Um, are not necessarily conclusively true. They are what people think is probably likely. Uh, so it seems to be the consensus of opinion that uh, Athelstan's mother was of low rank. Um, in the last kingdom, uh, she is she is um, shown as being of very low rank. And in fact, Edward the Elder marries uh, a second time and effectively Athelstan is regarded as illegitimate effectively and uh, there is some um, evidence that that's how uh, he was seen during his lifetime which may well have led to some of the issues that arose on his father's death so he he was the oldest son of his father by the first wife uh, there went on to be three wives but unlike uh, the portrayal in the last kingdom um, Equin herself was not uh, displaced, uh, and she was she actually died at a fairly early age. Um, but obviously, this wasn't necessarily very good for Athelstan. So, um, Athelstan grew up, as we say, um, looked after by Ethelfled, not uh, under the due, uh, under the direct care of his own father, and to some extent would have been um, considered by. Uh, the new, uh, the new. In fact, they weren't queens. They didn't have queens, did they? The Saxons, which is very interesting, as you observed last week. So the new uh, wife of Edward the Elder would have considered Athelstan to have been a threat to her own children, um, who were, I think, uh, Elfward and Edwin. Uh, both of which uh, I'm, I'm, very, I'm really looking forward to talking to you about that, Callum, about what happened to them. So. Mm. Anyway, Callum was very keen to get me moving on until the year 924. And Callum will tell us what happened in 924, Callum. All right, so, yeah, we picked up from uh, where we ended last week. So, um, King Edward the Elder died at Farndon in northern Mercia on the 17th of July, 924. Um, and the ensuing events are a little bit unclear. Um, Elfweard was Eld Edward's oldest son by Ethled. Um, and had ranked above Athelstan in the Wessex court. Um, we don't know this for sure, but we we can sort of guess that Edward's plan was maybe to have Elfweard be the successor of King in Wessex, and then Athelstan to take over as King of Mercia. 
Um, you know, we can tell us for several reasons. Obviously, um, we talked last week about how Ethel Fled's daughter was taken out of Mercia to mm. basically be put in a monastery. Um, whereas, you know, that plan to Ethelstan in place to, you know, become king of Mercia. So we think that was probably Edward's plan. And obviously, this didn't quite go to uh, go how he wanted because um, sh- very shortly after Edward died himself, I think it was only 13 days, in fact, 13 to 18 days later, um, his, his oldest son died as well. So this obviously left Wessex without a king. Yeah, sorry, I, was just, I, I wanted to come in on that. Thank you, thank you for, for allowing me to do so, Mr. Learned Man. Um, so just to be clear on this, um, uh, beyond all doubt, uh, Athelstan was king of Mercia in 924, so there was no uh, problem with him succeeding to become the king of the Mercians. Uh, that definitely happened. Um, it is then generally considered that there was a period... Uh, before he was able to uh, exert his control over uh, over Wessex itself. Um, and I'm quite interested to hear whether you think um, Athelstan may have had a part to play in the death of his younger brother. I, It's funny, actually. I, I've never thought about that possibility before. I don't think that is the case, from what we know of his character. Well, I, I, I would probably have to disagree with you there, but um, um, especially when we come on to talk about Edwin, of course, uh, which is a very interesting uh, part of today's show, I think. I mean, I, I, I think one of the things which is very frustrating um, about uh, studying Anglo-Saxons um, and is true of most of... Um, so, as we discussed, it's true of um, Ethelfled herself... And, and, and actually true of Athel Stan, as we'll come on to later. Um, th- th- they seem to be sort of um, running around fighting in battles, and then all of a sudden they die, uh, mm. you know, within a, a year or so. Um, and, you know, I, I try really hard to find out whether they died because they drank too much or they had measles or someone chopped their heads off or something, and, and it just said they died, you know, and you can't find out why they died. Um so, um, Elf Weird, I think I did read something. Uh, I did read something when I was doing my research for today's show. There are, I think, there is a school of opinion that he was involved in uh, Elf Weird's death. It just seems incredibly, um, incredibly convenient uh, that uh, his his younger brother, who, who as you say, um, actually though was was lined up for the top job over him because of uh, because of uh, the way uh, the marriages went uh, that the elf weird should should um you know could die within 3 weeks of um edward the elder's death i just i just yeah. would I would ha- I would have to be quite suspicious i think yeah sure i think the um i think the caveat to that is that um there doesn't seem to have been any resistance at all, actually, against Ethelstan at the time of his death. He wasn't sure, certainly wasn't welcomed as a, you know, a king after after um, Ethelweird died or anything like that. But you know, we've got um, you know charters and stuff from that time which show that he was sort of present at the time um, in front of you know bishops of Wessex and stuff like that. And I think that if it was suspected that he had killed you know, the king of Wessex, yeah. maybe there would be more backlash against him and maybe Edwin himself would have been quicker to to raise an army against Ethelstan, maybe even, um, whereas there's no evidence of that. Yes, that, 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 that's the next obvious question for you, uh, good sir. Um, so why didn't Edwin become the king upon his brother dying? Yeah, that, this is, the, this is um, one of the mysterious things like you mentioned, you know, going on about, you know, you read... There are some quite grandiose statements in different texts of the time, and they sort of just wash over what you would think is in very important details. The truth of the matter is we don't really know why Edwin didn't become king at the time. Um, you could very much argue that maybe he he tried to, and he was just unsuccessful in doing so. Either way, what we know is at first, after Ethelweir died, there was a small portion of time where Wessex went without a king, Ethelstan was present in Wessex, but he was very much treated as the king of Mercia, mm-hmm. not as the king of Wessex and Mercia. Mm-hmm. 
we don't really know a whole lot of what Edward Edwin was doing at the time. Um, all we know is that in 933, he drowned in a shipwreck in the North Sea. Ah, right. That's pretty That's pretty much all we sort of know about him, really. That's a, we don't really know much more than that. Yeah, I wanted to, to, to talk about that in a bit more detail, if that's okay with you. Um, yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, so uh, according to my research, um, as I say, Athelstan became king of Mercia almost instantaneously upon um, his father's death, but it, it actually wasn't until 925 uh, in the next year that he was actually crowned king of Wessex. Uh, and that yeah. was rather interestingly done at Kingston-upon-Thames, um, mm -hmm. which uh, I think was chosen because it was sort of... Um, the bridge between Mercia and Wessex. It was sort of, uh, uh, you know, somewhere that sort of united the two nations. So he was, he was crying. Hmm? Mm. A diplomatic decision. Yeah. Anything else to add about uh, the coronation? Yeah, I just, yeah. So he certainly wasn't welcomed in Wessex. His coronation wasn't welcomed at all. Um, and there's even um, accounts of a nobleman called Alfred. We don't know much about him. But apparently he even had a plot to blind, oh, yes. physically blind um, Athelstan because uh, yeah. blinding would have been a, su a sufficient disability yes. to render Athelstan ineligible for kingship in Wessex. So we know that there was an attempt to maim him, to make him yeah, ineligible to become king of Wessex. Obviously, this would have been this must have been thwarted. There, were, there isn't any account of whether Alfred was killed or what happened. All we know, obviously, that Athelstan wasn't blinded. And this wasn't um, this wasn't successful. Um, before um, so filling the bridge between Edwin dying, we do know that tensions between Ethelstan and Winchester continued for for some years bef before even Edwin's death. Um, in fact, the Bishop of Winchester didn't even attend the coronation of Ethelstan or witness any of his known charters right up until nine two eight. But it rather makes you wonder. So, how did he manage to be? Who did he manage to? You know, who who was powerful enough to actually get him over the line, so to speak? Hmm. I think we can we can certainly guess at a couple of things and um, make some educated guesses. I think you know we have to remember that he was brought up by Athelfled, who was extremely charming um, and extremely intelligent notoriously good at sort of like wooing people as it were mm -hmm. i think um you can tell certainly from later on accounts but he would have been like it all his life ethelston was just it was just like his auntie in this respect he also unlike his grandfather didn't have any physical ailments alfred the great so i imagine he would have been quite a force to be reckoned with very intelligent man probably a very very physically fit man we know that he was already a successful war leader um, Ethelfled groomed him to be a good warrior, and he actually led several campaigns into Northumbria while he was serving under her in the Mercian court. So he would have been battle-hardened, extremely intelligent, um, probably extremely politically savvy, very cerebral, very charming man. Mm. He's got, it's quite a dangerous com combination for anybody that has any chinks in their armour, you know? Yes, well, that's, that's something we'll come on to. So I think the next thing I wanted to talk about was... Um, I, I, when I when I first when I, I didn't know this um, before I was researching for today's show, um, so Athelstan never got married. Mm. Do you have any views so, on why that was why that was so? Yeah, um, I think that there's sort of two schools of thought with that. There is um, one school of thought is that Wessex wouldn't accept him as king unless he took a pledge of you know piety and celibacy. So that was the only way that he could become king of Wessex, mm -hmm. you know, obviously, so his bloodline wouldn't endure. Um, the other one is that we know he was an extremely religious man, just like his grandfather, King Alfred the Great, um, extremely religious. But, you know, everything he did in, in his life was pretty much centered around Christianity and his love for God. So the other school of thought is that he was religiously motivated and sort of determined to live a, a life of chastity um, and took it very, very seriously, um, which, uh, I mean, to me and you might sound a little bit silly, but I mean, in those days, I, I suppose he took it as a, as, as something that, as a pride, you know, as something to do with pride. 
Well, of course, again, because of the lack of um, lack of uh, evidence, uh, we we don't know whether he had um, hmm. seventy three million concubines or or even I'm whether sure. whether he was um, you know. Uh, not necessarily if, if, attracted to women, you know. I mean, if, if he died a virgin, then that was that's quite a, a feat for a man that was as powerful as him. You know, for a man that was, <laughs> Bible account, was a, a good-looking man who was the most powerful man in Britain. What a, what a um, fascinating conversation to be having on our history channel. Yeah, who knows? He might have had a thousand bastards like Robert Baratheon in Game of Thrones. We don't know. Hmm, interesting. So uh, <laughs> th- we ne- next have. Um, so maybe you and I are going to have a difference of opinion over this. Uh, so we have the um, the death of Edwin, which is, um, uh, I think, you know, by by the standards of of uh, twenty twenty. Um, mm-hmm. I was thinking about this, you know, about the um, attitudes towards the statues in Bristol and London, uh, and how um, people today are judging people like Edward Colston, who, yes, he was involved in the slave trade, but was also an enormous enormous philanthropist for for Bristol um and so people are very much judging um people who were considered to be great at the time by the standards of today uh and I think uh I'm very I was very mindful of of this when I was reflecting upon uh Edwin's death so mm. effectively my understanding is is um that uh Athelstan was threatened by Edwin uh and there seems to have been some sort of trouble uh, so whether you know Edwin was openly mutinying against him or lobbying to be king or something, uh, and uh, rather interestingly, uh, and again I think there's a there's a there's a parallel in uh, one of the one of the um, more interesting uh, period you know, period documentaries, uh, not documentaries but period dramas uh, of this time, where Edwin is basically. Um, put on to a leaky, uh, the, the literature says a leaking boat. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not quite sure what that means, the leaking boat. But um, uh, he's put on a boat that isn't particularly seaworthy. Uh, presumably, uh, in the expectation, this boat is not going to last very long. And therefore, um, you know, the, the, the boat will sail out. And then uh, he will die out of the gaze of the public eye, so to speak. And Athelstan can... Um, sort of deny all knowledge of of what's happened. Uh, from what I understand, happened is Edwin himself uh, chose rather than wait for the inevitable, he actually dived into the sea uh, and effectively drowned of his own volition. That's uh, wow. that's and, and so uh, so my reading is is that obviously. Um, uh, Legend has it, well, you know, or folklore probably more than legend, is that Athelstan, um, suddenly having got rid of his opponent, saw the light and was very troubled uh, by what he had done. Uh, and I think he built uh, some sort of shrine or, uh, mm. do- uh, or, or, or building in Edwin's honour, which might have been in Dorset, if I remember rightly, from my history. Um, mm. And... Um, Again, though, it, it 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 really makes me wonder. Going back to um, the other brother, you know, if 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 Athelstan was capable of such intrigue, maybe uh, this wasn't the first time he did it. Yeah, it's very interesting, and it all, we've actually sort of got a little murder mystery on our hands here, haven't we? You could even say. Mm. But um, as I said, it's it's all quite ambiguous. But we know that the twelfth century chronicler Simeon of Durham who was one of the Normans' most well-known historians, said that Athelstan ordered Edwin to be drowned. Um, but a lot of historians disagree with this. And as, as uh, you said at the beginning of the show, um, especially around sort of the Norman medi- medieval period, a lot of historians just sort of filled in the blanks with whatever they thought was the most exciting story. So we don't know if this is true or not. Um, and another school of thought is that Edwin might have fled England after an unsuccessful rebellion against Ethelson's rule. Um, but either way, his death helped put an end to Winchester's opposition. I think um, the place where Edwin was sent for burial was, I don't know, I actually don't know where this is, so I'm sure you can help me out. It's the Abbey of St. Burton in St. Omer. Do you know where that is? No. 
I, I, I assume that it may not even be in, in England. Maybe it's somewhere in Frankia. I don't know. How do you spell Omer? O-M-E-R. Hmm. Maybe no. somewhere in northern France. But very interesting nonetheless. But as you said, after he died, Athelstan sent alms to the abbey for his dead brother and received monks to Wessex from the abbey and, you know, graciously gave them lots of money and gifts to take back with them to, um, you know, fund It's very good of him, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> very, very, like what we were saying, though, about being cerebral, very, very good politically, you know, because, I mean, talk about, you know, sweet talking the, the people that, you know, might actually have been coming to sort of chastise you. And they they sent him home. He sent him home basically going, oh, I've such a great chat, you know. <laughs> I mean, what's what's what? Uh, uh, something I meant to say earlier. Actually, we were talking last week about um, whether whether we thought that Mercia was a vassal kingdom of of Wessex or not. And I guess um, you know, there's so many conflicting facts here. Uh, you know, if if Mercia was a vassal kingdom of Wessex, then uh, it, it rather begs the question why uh, Elfweird didn't be wasn't made king of of both kingdoms like his father was but maybe mm. as you say maybe that that's that was the plan of his father maybe the, his father thought that was uh how he wanted it to go but um it doesn't yeah. it doesn't seem you know on the basis of what we know a recipe for success that um Elfweird and Athelstan would have been uh capable of successfully integrating together shall we say yeah i, I actually i actually have a a theory about this and it is just a theory but we, there are accounts that Alfred the Great showered Athelstan mm. in gifts when Athelstan was a young boy um, and actually treated him probably better than Alfred ever treated Edward the Elder, which is quite interesting. Um, so I, the, Alfred seemed to, seemed to see greatness in Athelstan, even when he was a, you know, not much more than a toddler. Really fine, very in- yeah. yeah, yeah, which is very intriguing. I, you could maybe surmise that Edward was potentially even jealous of Ethelston. Mm. Um, that's why he didn't want him to become as mighty as a ruler as Edward was. Um, either that, or the only other conclusion <laughs> I can think of is that Edward didn't think that any of his sons were great enough to have the responsibility of being king of as much territory as he was. I don't think this is the case. I think that Ethelston would have probably quite clearly been capable um, and I think that it would have actually probably worked in Ethelstan's favour to have been brought up under Ethelfled, who, as we discussed last week, was was probably pound for pound greater than Edward was. Hmm. So that, I think the next um, most next noteworthy um, event of uh, Ethelstan's life would be uh, conquering York in 927. So what can you tell us about that? Oh, yeah. So in January 926, um, Athelstan arranged for one of his sisters to marry King Citric of York, who was the Viking ruler of York. Um, the two kings basically agreed not to invade each other's territories or support each other's enemies um, while they lived. Um, but only a year after this, Citric died. Maybe this comes back into our murder mysteries. <laughs> you know, maybe Athelstan had him had him uh, assassinated because this is it, all very convenient for Athelstan. But the following year, Citric died, and Athelstan seized the chance to um, invade. Uh, Guthfrith was a Viking king of Dublin and Citric's cousin, and he led a fleet from Dublin to try and take the throne. But Athelstan won a massive battle and prevailed, capturing York um, and received the submission of the Danish people in York. Yeah, this, obviously this is um, incredibly significant because it basically meant... Uh, at that point, that uh, Athelstan was now uh, the first, the first person in history to be effectively the overlord of all of England. Yeah, massively, massively, um, a defining, a defining po- moment in um, British history, and it, it's sort of um, what's what I think is quite nice. Is I mean, we can only guess at this, but I assume that Athelstan and Athelfled had a very close relationship, and he was probably obviously a lot closer to Athelfled than he was to his father. And what's nice is we touched on how um, Ethelfled actually won through through battle and negotiation mm. the allegiance of the King of York before, mm. but died before they could sign the treaty. So Ethelstan sort of um, 
picked up where she left off and managed to succeed where she just she ever so slightly fell short, which is which is quite a nice, you know, from a sentimental point of view. Um, yeah, massive, massive point in um, Britain's history. Yes. So um, it, it, this then meant that uh, officially in the history books from 927 until Atherston's death, he is officially recorded as king of all England. Uh, mm. And all the and the coins were struck accordingly. So uh, this was a, a, an amazing achievement. So you consider that um, Athelstan uh, ascended the, the throne of, of Mercia in 924, uh, was by no means accepted by uh, the Wessex people, and yet within three years he, he actually did something that uh, no his father and his grandfather had been unable to do. Uh, mm. And... Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing which I think is incredibly noteworthy um, is, as far as I'm aware, uh, he had a 100% success rate in battles over his lifetime. So he 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 didn't lose a single battle, which is uh, yeah. When you consider, you know, I think you were telling us last week. Um, I think or no, maybe in in Alfred's uh, in Alfred's week that um, there was something like 11 battles. Um, in 877, of which uh, the Vikings only won two. Oh, uh, the Saxons, yes. only won, Saxons only won two out of 11. Um, so for Athelstan to actually uh, go through his lifetime uh, undefeated is, um, is, is really quite remarkable. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and also, I think we need to put into perspective, it's not like the Vikings around this time got weaker. We know that, like, Frankia... And all these place, other places in Europe were still living in fear of the Vikings and were still being pillaged regularly. What we see in, in, um, in England through, through um, what started with Alfred's sort of, you know, his, his burrs and his, and his, uh, his reconcentration on militarization is by this point in history, um, Anglo-Saxon Britain was the cream of the crop in all of Europe. They were, they, they were the top intellectually, militaristically. As I said, in, in Athelstan's lifetime, as you said, it didn't lose a single battle. And these were against great warriors. These weren't just some, some rabble that he was fighting. I mean, it would have, it's quite actually quite awe-inspiring. The more you look into it, the more impressive you realise it is. Um, and it's, as I said, it's the, um, the governing tactics and the diplomacy and all of these things that go into it as well. So we know that when he did take York, he had the support of all the Welsh kings, there were four Welsh kingdoms at the time, as you mentioned last episode. He had he had all of them, all of their armies, as well as obviously the kingdoms of East Anglia, which were actually mainly Danes in terms of their blood, anyway. Um, Dan Danes and Mercia and Wessex. So he'd had a massive army coming up with him, and yeah. they're all loyal to him. Yeah, I think um, I think we touched on this last week. We we started to see in Edward the Elder's um, uh, reign. Um, uh, conflict between uh the danish vikings and the norwegian vikings which probably was very helpful to athelstan mm. yeah sure so um before we move on to um uh the other sort of uh, amazing military achievements of athelstan's uh reign um he also um uh, received a lot of plaudits for his achievements in administration and the centralization of government. So what can you tell us about that? Well, it's yeah, again, it's really um, a, a massively defining point in, in Britain, British history. So what we saw in, say, Alfred the Great's day was, you know, you would have, say, a, a king of Wessex, and then they would have eldermen. And essentially what an elderman was, he was the leader of a county. So they would oversee a county for him, you know, so there'd be like the elderman of Devon, of Somerset, blah, blah, blah. And he, they didn't have like a fixed place of parliament like we have today. What would happen is the king would call a Witten, which is basically like calling a royal council. He would call the Witten, and wherever the king called the Witten, all of his eldermen would have to meet there. Um, they, they, they'd govern, they'd talk about what was going to happen, and you know they, they'd set to work. Now, what happened in Athelstan's time is it goes far beyond that, because we, we start seeing you know, governing on such a grand scale, you know, you can't have a, a room full of, you know, eight men having a chat over a cup of, me of mead talking about, you know, what you're going to do next. They, he was governing such a massive region that it would have seen very much like Parliament does today. 
you would have had bishops from all over the country, saints from all over the country, eldermen, you know, kings um, or, you know, sub kings, I think they were called, you know, all the kings of Wales and their noblemen, all of the, the leaders of Strathclyde, uh, Scotland, all of these people would have been there. So it would have been hundreds of people in his court. So it would have been very, very different from, you know, his grandfather's time. Um, so we see a massive difference and a massive sort of upscaling of administration during Ethelstan's time. And, and actually, some historians say that although this obviously wouldn't have been his, his goal, it was actually the first time we see a government like we see in Britain today. Yeah, and of course, you know, without going too far into the future, um, one, of, one of the reasons that uh, the Normans found it so easy to conquer, conquer, <laughs> conquer England um, uh, was in fact the superb uh, local government and administration of the kingdom, which um, was basically mm. uh, quite easy for someone just to slot into and, and replicate. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a mixed bag, isn't it? Because with, with a centralised government, well, you need to have a centralised government to get out of that, um, you know, province-style um, rulership, you know, with different kings in different provinces. You need a centralised government. But at the same time, obviously, you, yeah, you are more vulnerable in terms of if you just come over and you completely conquer that, then um, you are left far more vulnerable. Yeah, so before we get on to um, the next exciting bit, anything, any other little, little facts about um, sort of... Uh, Athelstan's reign before we get on to uh, the Scottish things. Yeah, just just a couple of little things actually. Um, so after he, he conquered York, um, it led to seven years of peace in the north, which I think was the longest amount of time there had gone without a single battle <laughs> in um, the whole of Britain since like the Roman times. I think something something crazy like that, which is you know seven whole years of peace, might not sound a lot in the, in the, these days, but. Uh, in those days, it would have been quite a, a massive accomplishment. Um, also, I want to talk about in his time his his reforms in terms of uh, law. So he uh, he was very big on trying to make the place very civilized. He was a massive fan of Charlemagne, um, and a lot of people actually in Francia compared him to to Charlemagne even in his lifetime, which is a, a massive, obviously, compliment mm -hmm. to to Athelstan. But he was the first person to bring in um, essentially police forces. Mm -hmm. So he thought that theft and things like that was disgusting. Oh, yeah, yeah. That theft was like the basis of of um, being uncivilized. Um, so he brought in basically what was like a, a modern police force. And all this would mean is that there was a, a group of appointed sort of 10 to 12 men that would um, sort of walk around every single sort of settlement and they would make sure basically that, that everyone was behaving themselves, that, that nobody was stealing and, and assaulting anybody in any way. Um, and I, I actually think this is quite a, quite a cool thing to read because um, in one of the scriptures that we got about our own family name, so you're just being a bit indulgent a, mi a minute, um, our surname for everyone listening it is Wait. Um, So they were essentially like an early form of police force and late at night when everyone else was asleep they would have wandered around with their mm -hmm. torches and basically just made sure that everything was kept in order so i thought it was quite interesting reading um reading that i think they were singing christmas carols personally they, if they were anything like you they were most definitely probably singing very loudly and keeping everyone after, awake yeah. after drinking <laughs> A lot of a lot of mead. Yeah, uh, definitely, obviously. <laughs> so I think um, uh, you, you may correct me over this. Um, so um, we we then go to uh, 934 with a very successful yeah. invasion of Scotland. But I think that yeah. um, I think that what led to that was that the Scottish King Constantine or Time the Second. Um, mm. actually invaded England with some Viking allies. Is that right? Yeah, the, this is it's quite an ambiguous thing, like, like many things we're talking about here. Um, what we know is, is that in 934, Eldred of Bamba died. So he was basically like one of the key rulers of, of the north. He was one of the people 
that um, you know when Ethelstan conquered York, there was a big meeting. You know, the king of Strathclyde, the king of of uh, Scotland, um, Eldred of Bamber, they all met. Which is Bamber is is the same place from the last kingdom that's called Bebember. So yeah. you, uh, Uhtred of Bamber, Eldred of Bamber would have been his relative. Um, you know, if if Uhtred was real, that is. He was real. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so Eldred of Bamber died. And what there seems to have been is a dispute over who had the land. So um, King Constantine thought that he should take over the land. And Athelstan said, you know, no, sod off. I'm having this. I'm the big daddy at the end of the day. I'm overlord of Britain. You're just one of you're just king of Scotland. Um, so we think that's what led to the battle. Now we're, we're, so we just make sure we don't get ahead of ourselves here. We're, we're, we're still in 934, Callum. So this is... Um... Yeah, yeah. This is uh, the invasion of Scotland um, and defeating the Scots. And I think Constantine II basically swore, um, you know, allegiance or whatever it was to, to Athelstan. Um, certainly for the time being, anyway. Oh, interesting. Well, so you think that, sorry, did you just say that Constantine had allegiance to Athelstan in 934? Yeah, because we because Athelstan invaded Scotland and subjugated the Scots, uh, and one of the outcomes of that was Constantine uh, recognizing Athelstan's sort of superiority over him. But it was oh yeah, no. it, sure. My 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 only point was is that he already had recognized his superiority after he after he became king of York and king of Northumbria, but then obviously Constantine and and Athelstan had that debate over Bamber in 934 when Eldred died and we think that's what led this is what led to the invasion of Scotland so they did make up again afterwards but that they think that's why they had the battle so then we, we have um, we move on three years to 937 um, and uh, we have this massive invasion of England by the Scots and the Vikings and various other um, people on their side so there were uh, I think I think I read somewhere, you know, five to seven different nationalities all on the side of uh, uh, Constantine's army or, or, or uh, whatever the Viking Dublin leader was that we mentioned earlier that ended in Frith. Um, so they 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 basically um, r ran amok through the north of England, and um, uh, I think it's true to say that Athelstan gathered the largest army ever seen. Um, in the British Isles up to that point. Is that right? Yeah, so this battle would have been the biggest battle that anybody would have seen since the days of the Romans. Um, Olaf Guthrithson, who was the the son of Guthrith, who we were talking about earlier, who Ethelstan defeated for to become um, king of Northumbria, his son Olaf um, was a Norse king of Dublin. And he made an alliance with the Norse and the Scots, um, and he c cemented the Scottish alliance with the Norse by um, marrying um, King Constantine's daughter, King Constantine of Scotland's daughter. So he married her. Um, Olaf defeated all of his rivals in sort of the Viking world to become king of all the Viking armies. So sort of a massive force. Um, at, Olaf and Constantine knew that individually they could not stand up to Athelstan, but they knew that if they combined their forces, they'd have a pretty good chance. There would have been a massive, massive army behind them. As I said, pretty much the whole Viking world and all of Scotland would have been behind them. Um, and in autumn, they managed to convince the leaders of Strathclyde, the Strathclyde Britons under King Owain, also to invade England. So we then have... Um... Arguably, uh, yeah, one, probably one of the three biggest battles in English history, uh, yeah. or, or or even British history, and certainly, uh, uh, in my opinion, the first uh, battle on British soil that involved uh, multiple nations, and indeed people from outside the British Isles, which was uh, Brunnenburg. I don't know how, how you would pronounce it, but um, mm. Brunnenburg. So this this was a quite a staggering battle with um, yeah. many thousands on each side, wasn't it? Yeah, really. Um, we we don't know the exact numbers, but we know as as I said, it, it would have been the the biggest army on either side seen since Roman occupation of Britain, since the Roman legions were there. Um, 
And what's quite interesting to note is it's, this says quite a lot about Ethelstan's character. Um, some historians almost criticise him for saying that he took a sort of sluggish, um, sort of leisurely sort of response to this invasion force. And it's really quite interesting. So rather than rather than freaking out and being like, oh, you know, what we got to call the banners? You know, we've got to get all the eldermen, raise all the armies. We need to fight right now. He actually just sort of sat back, um, basically sipped his wine and thought, yeah. OK, I'm going to let this play out a little bit. I'm going to see what happens. I'm going to let these sort of idiots tie themselves out a little bit, thinking that they're going to rustle my feathers. And apparently he sat around for, for quite some time, not taking any action. It's quite interesting. There's two ways you can look at this. You can either criticise him or you can realise actually what an intelligent and probably cerebral man he was. He he sat back and he spent weeks planning what was the best course of action. Um, and it's it's quite interesting. He's he's compared in this sense to, to Harold Harada of 1066. And he was saying, if Harold had done what Athelstan had done, then he might have won the Battle of Hastings. Because obviously what ha Harold did was march down battle worn already half an army and made you mean you mean harold godwinson you mean sorry harold godwinson harold Harada was the, yeah. the the king of the norse army yeah. thank you for correcting me um yeah harold godwinson obviously took a very rash approach yes. and um, ended up getting himself slaughtered what Ethelstan did the exact opposite of this he sat back he, he gathered his forces nice and slowly he made sure that every single soldier he could possibly um have under his yeah. command was assembled well fed nice and fat happy seen to the to by the concubines finest armor and weapons in the land and they were ready for battle so by the time that they the two sides did meet at the battle of bannon Burr, this resulted in an absolutely overwhelming victory for ethelston um we know that his his heart his young half brother um the future king edmund the first of of england was was there with him who did great at the battle um, Olaf managed to escape back to Dublin with the remnant of his forces, but really this would have been not very many people. He was absolutely, utterly crushed. Constantine lost his son at the battle, so this would have been absolutely crushing for King Constantine of Scotland. Um, the English did, of course, suffer heavy losses, as is natural in, in such a massive battle, including two of Ethelstan's cousins, um, you know, sons of Edward the Elder's younger brother, Ethelweird. So they, we w weren't without losses, but yeah, an overwhelming victory for Athelstan. Yeah, just to put this into context, um, so uh, five kings and seven earls uh, lost their lives at that battle, uh, mm -hmm. which is quite staggering, isn't it? Cool, absolutely staggering. I mean, it was just, I mean, talk about uh, you know a grand battle. You know, I mean, absolutely amazing. It's like something from a movie. You know, it, it, it's it's quite interesting, isn't it? How um, in history, you know, there's one thing um, we'll never know. You know why why it is that, for instance, um, you know, we you and I were both taught about Alfred burning the cakes. Um, uh, you know, and there's there's a lot of reverence of Alfred uh, as a person, allowing him to be voted the 14th greatest Englishman of all time, uh, mm. and yet. Um, Brunnenburg, which was uh, probably, well, it's probably certainly from the point of view of an English person and uh, the English nation, uh, it was it was significant in 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 many many respects. It was significant politically, culturally, militarily. Um, it was, as you, mm -hmm. I I suspect actually you say about the Romans. I mean, I would have, I would have thought that. Um, Short of uh, the Romans f facing the Iceni, when I think Boudicca had something like ten thousand troops under her command, fighting something like two or three thousand Romans, I think it's mm. you know that sort of numbers. Um, mm. This would have been bigger than that, uh, and, mm. and on a scale uh, that had never been seen. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of the quite um, decisive battles um, fought earlier would have probably only had a thousand people on the battlefield uh yeah whereas this, yeah. this would have had many many thousands of people um for those who are interested there's some very good uh documentaries on Brunnenberg on youtube um which, which makes make for fascinating uh viewing so um 
Yeah, so old, old Athelstan triumphs at Brunnenburg and uh, is, 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 is very sad. So in a way, you could say that, um, you know, uh, as the song says, the history book on the shelf is always repeating itself. So just just like his 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 his, his wonderful auntie, uh, who at the peak of her powers, having just subjugated most of the northern lords, uh, died very shortly afterwards. This is what happened to Athelstan. So Athelstan reaches a career high point in 937, and at this point, it probably would be true to say you could almost say he was king of Britain. Yeah. And yeah. I, so we. That's definitely what he was seen as. Um, we know that all of um, Francia at the time, modern day France, were completely in awe of Athelstan. And they, there are historical records from that time. They were very literate people, the Franks. And there are lots of historical accounts from all over Francia and modern day, uh, and, and Saxony, modern day Saxony, sorry, modern day Germany, but Saxony at the time. Um, and they, they refer to him as overlord of Britain. And as I said, they, they, they refer to him as overall as Britain and they compare him to Charlemagne. Um, there are some texts even in Francia and Saxony that describe him as an emperor um, and describe him as the greatest person, sorry, the greatest Christian in the world, I think, at his time, which is this is an amazing praise. We also know that um, he was seen so highly of by the people of Francia and Saxony that they um, they showered him in gifts. I, I read something absolutely amazing, um, and it was um, one of the Frankish kings um, thought so highly of Ethelstan that he he sought him out and he gave him the sword of Charlemagne, um, and a crown a crown made of pure gold, and one of the purported uh, thorns from um, Jesus Christ's um, crown of thorns, which um, obviously in in um, Christian society would have been it, uh, um, valuable beyond description. So, what do we know about him dying, then, Callum? Uh, have there any any uh, evidence as to why he died? Because um, um, there he is, uh, as I say, uh, he's 40, 40, 43 years old. Uh, clearly, very active because uh, there's no reason to believe he didn't fight himself at Brandenburg. Um, yeah, and yet two years within two years of that, he's dead. Um, yeah, any idea why? Yeah, so it's, it's it's funny, isn't it? I mean, it, these time and time again in these um in these different annals and stuff, there's there's no mention of of why they die. Um, we we have a lot of to thank William of Malmesbury for. So William of Malmesbury, we brought him up in every single episode we've talked about. He was probably the Normans' most famous historian and we have a lot to thank him for with probably half of the knowledge we have is from William of Malmesbury who gathered all of the texts from all over Britain you know before they would have been burnt or destroyed and he made you know compiled texts all made out of you know the Anglo-Saxon chronicles lots of other sources include of these including you know um, scrolls and sources from Francia and Saxony all over the western world so we have a lot to thank him for but yeah as you said no, no mention of, of why he died um, all we know is that he died at Gloucester on the 27th of October, 939. Um, a bit like Ethelflaed, talking about Ethelflaed last episode. You know, this man fought a lot of battles in his life. I, I expect by this time in his life, I expect he was he was quite battle-worn. I would be, you know, surprised if he didn't have some pretty nasty injuries. Um, yeah, in those days, you know, you could die of infection. It could have been infection, could have been a, a, any number of things. Um, we talked about life expectancy in one of the first episodes of this. Um, you know, he by this point, he was, for those times, a fairly decent age. <laughs> I mean, he was, he was about 45 years old, which, you know, only 15 years older than I am. But... Uh, yeah, for, for such a for such a, a glorious life, you know, he did so much in his life. Um, you know, I, I suppose, without sounding cheesy, it's like you know the, the brightest flames burn out quickest, don't they? Yeah, it's just, again, it's uh, be very interesting to have seen what would have happened if he'd lived another ten years, for instance. You know, what 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 impact that would have had. Um, but uh, going back to last week, so we uh, Edward the Elder had fourteen children. Um, I think two two children by uh, the first first wife Egwin, 
uh, and then uh, three, I think, by the middle wife, and then a whole shed load more by the last one. And uh, it's interesting because um, all all of the no, in fact, I think thinking about it, there were five. I think there were five children of the second wife. Um, and what actually happened is Athelstan was succeeded by Edmund Ironside, wasn't he? Um, yes. Who was the eldest son of the third wife, with all of the children of the second wife predeceasing Edmund. Uh, yeah. So Edmund himself um, was quite formidable. He he would have been very active at Brunnenburg, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yep. We mentioned, we, we touched on that. Him, Athelstan deliberately would have taken him with him on all of these campaigns. He was grooming him, knowing that he would have been king after his death. Yeah, so what a wonderful um, label to be given, Ironside. Isn't that uh, quite something, isn't it? Definitely appeals to the man in you, doesn't it? Are you, are you looking at me when you're saying that? or uh... <laughs> <laughs> It's a manly name, that's what I'm getting at. It's a, it's a manly name. Hello, my name is Ironside. I think he used to be a detective, but uh, that's got no, <laughs> no place in a series on the birth of the nation. So... Um, yeah, so I think we've we've um, we've we've done justice to to Athelstan. So this is this is a man who um, incredibly influential in English history. I suppose also British history. Um, again, just uh, Callum was talking about our family name. Uh, one of the other things uh, which I'd like to to note is uh, one of the Welsh kings that Callum referred to. One of the four kings was a king called Huel Dar. Uh, who is Callum? Well, my thirty-five times great grandfather. Um, mm. So, um, in effect, the uh, we were there. If you know, we were, we were, we were. Certainly in our, blood. hmm? Certainly in our bloodline, and considering that you um, are predominantly um, have Norse blood running through your veins, um, as do I, you might have even had a little bit of Olaf in you as well. Who knows? Yeah, I know, um, obviously, again, so, uh, without being too sort of um, whatever the word is about families. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, your mother, uh, my wife, uh, is, is, is directly related to Citric, for instance. Uh, yeah. So from your point of view, obviously, you know, there's a there's a massive real connection with this period. And many yeah. of the characters um, uh, that that were active at this time, um, you know, are, are 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 in your bloodlines. That's really quite amazing. So the big old dispute. So Athelstan, first king of the English. Um, yeah. Uh, it's quite quite um, interesting that uh, uh, within what seventy years of this, uh, we have a Danish king, uh, but that's for another episode. So. Uh, Thank you very much for your contribution today, Callum. That was, uh, I think, a very slick, uh, a very slick performance uh, with your usual insight. Um, Do you mind if I just add something? Just, just oh, one more add, thing. You can add whatever you like. Thank you. I just, I just, I just thought it'd be a nice little way to round up, um, talking about where uh, he he chose to be buried. So. Oh yes, so yes, um, I meant to talk about that as well. Thank you. Yeah. So, Athelstan decided that he wanted to be, to be buried at Malmesbury Abbey where he had buried his cousins who died at Bar Bar Barrenburg. Um, what's quite interesting to note is that no other member of the West Saxon royal family was buried there. Um, and according to William of Malmesbury, Athelstan's choice reflected his devotion both to the Abbey um, and also he never forgot that Wessex opposed his rule so mm. much early on. Um, and he didn't want to, he didn't want to honour Wessex by being buried at Winchester, where all the Wessex kings traditionally were. So instead, yeah, he um, he was buried at Malmesbury, which is um, which is in Somerset, isn't it? Um, it's actually in, in Wiltshire, I think. Um, oh, is it? Uh, no, well, the reason I meant to mention it was um, uh, we actually went uh, for a trip to Malmesbury, uh, uh, Lisa, Lisa Waite and I, um, I'm not sure how long ago, three years, four years. Um, and I didn't know at the time that Athelstan was buried in Malmesbury. And we always mm. like to look at churches and, uh, you know, abbeys and whatever. So we went into, uh, and I, I, I obviously as a historian, uh, I came across um, Athelstan's tomb, which was, so I actually have been there, uh, th thing of great, 
note to me, you know, uh, it's quite extraordinary, really, that to think that um, somebody somebody of that significance uh, was almost like casually buried in this place and nobody knows he's there sort of thing, you know. So, um, yeah, no, it made, it made a big impression on me. It was, um, it was, I remember it being quite a big event. So, yeah, Malmesbury, um, for, for those of you who, who don't know, so Malmesbury is... Um, uh, quite easily accessible off the M4, so um, quite a, a lovely, charming, charming little town with nice features. So um, anyway, so that's uh, that's the end of Athelstan. Uh, next week we're moving on to. Uh, uh, we've already got three shows left, obviously culminating in um, uh, Battle of Hastings itself. So uh, next week we're going to take you through the reign of Edmund Ironside and. Uh, start to see the emerging influence of uh, Sven Forkbeard in particular. So um, thank you to Callum. Um, thank you all for watching. Uh, keep the comments going. And um, we've enjoyed doing today's show. And take care. Bye. -bye.